Hello everybody, welcome to this Revision webinar, which this time is going to be looking at aspects of international trade. We often talk about countries <coughs> and their trade policies, and one of the concepts that often comes up in discussion is the idea of free trade. Free trade is not the same as, as fair trade, uh, there's quite an important distinction there, but free trade is any trade in goods and services across national borders, which is essentially free from artificial barriers such as tariffs, uh, quotas or other forms of, of non-tariff barrier. So when, whenever you're studying the world economy, globalization, the balance of payments, you're going to be discussing trade in goods and services. And trade flows from essentially the idea that countries uh, specialize in the, in the goods and services they're best at. And then they find through exchange rates and financial systems, they find ways of, of trading and exchanging those products. Uh, exporting the things they're relatively better at and importing the products that they have a relative disadvantage in. Now in this session there's a huge amount one could cover in terms of trade economics. What I thought I would just focus on is two particular aspects of trade theory. I'm going to be doing a second special revision webcast on protectionism. I'll touch a little bit on that uh, in this session but that's the you know, most of the, the content will be left for another time. So we're going to focus on two areas. One is the idea of the gains from trade, why, why is trade important. And then we're going to be looking at something called intra-industry trade, which is something quite specialized but I think really quite important. So what about the gains from trade? Why, why do businesses, why do countries trade with each other? It's quite important to be able to find uh, a range of good arguments here for understanding the, the short-term and the long-term benefits of successful trade. Quite a few of the points are on this slide are actually microeconomic uh, in focus. This is an area of the syllabus, as you're revising, where you can bring together micro and macro in really quite a, uh, an effective and sophisticated way. So when we have trade, when we have international exchange of goods and services, that does create more competition uh, for domestic producers. Some of you will have uh, heard my revision webinar on contestable markets and when tariffs come down or quotas are abolished, markets become more contestable. That acts as a discipline on, on producers to keep their costs and their prices down and in theory it should lead to a more efficient allocation of scarce resources and lower unit costs and prices. I think one of the fundamental points about trade is it does open up markets, particularly where there might have been a domestic monopoly. Overall, if countries uh, specialize based on their relative advantage, uh, we can show mathematically and using diagrams that there are gains from trade. And I'll take you through an example of that in just a minute. But for example, trade does allow countries to, to specialize more deeply and allocate uh, labor and capital and other resources to specific, hopefully growing industries. For developing countries, uh, emerging economies, trade is, is nearly always a, an important source of, of growth and hopefully that feeds through um, in a more holistic way to, to better development outcomes. And finally, trade also has uh, not just gains in allocative and productive efficiency, but it should also in theory lead to some gains in dynamic efficiency. Ideas, processes, new products uh, oftentimes spill over from one country to another, particularly with trade and investment across, across borders. Not only do consumers get, get more choice in terms of what they can buy, but I think importantly you get these kind of intellectual property ideas uh, which are really quite important in the long term. We learn far more from our competitors often than we do from ourselves. In terms of developing countries, one could be a little bit more specific here. One can point, for example, to highly successful uh, countries that have, for example, escaped the middle income trap, countries such as South Korea and uh, Hong Kong, uh, and until recently, countries such as Ireland and Greece. But successful trade certainly generates very important foreign exchange reserves. If one thinks of a country, for example, such as China, uh, or Norway, which are running very large balance of payments surpluses on their current account, uh, 
and that allows them to build up billions of dollars worth of, of foreign currency reserves. In the case, for example, of China and Norway uh, and countries such as Ghana and Angola, they're now creating sovereign wealth funds based on those dollar reserves. Trade is also an important way of selling the goods and services that will allow you to import the technology, the high spec capital and also your energy needs uh, along the way to, to fuel a growing economy. And what can use standard ADS analysis to show for example how a rise in exports is an injection into the circular flow and that can have positive multiplier effects on supply chain industries that, that uh, help the export industries uh, meet the demand. Fundamentally I suppose one has to make a connection between trade and development. Hopefully the dynamic globalizing economies are able to, to use trade as a catalyst for increasing their per capita incomes and therefore over time achieving better outcomes on human development. So trade is important for these countries. However, as part of the evaluation, one I suppose has to be one has to be aware of the risks and the challenges that being a more open economy creates. Uh, as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, some countries are actually quite highly dependent on just one or two uh, primary uh, commodities. Of course, that leaves them vulnerable and exposed to highly volatile global demand and, and world prices, which can have a significant effect on, the, on the, their revenues from exports. Uh, whenever you are an open economy, uh, open to trade, open to investment, uh, the, there will be external shocks, both geopolitical, uh, environmental and economic, and that can have a significant effect. And clearly, uh, trade creates winners, hopefully, but also industries and people who lose out from trade. So if some industries go into reverse, there's always the big risk of, for example, structural unemployment affecting certain industries and certain regions of an economy. So keep in mind that trade has downsides as well as upsides. In theory, uh, trade should have more benefits than costs. Now what I thought I'd do in this uh, middle section of this webcast is just take you through one example of comparative advantage. I'm sure you've been through one in class. Uh, this is one that works for me. Uh, well, hopefully it'll work in the next five minutes. Comparative advantage is the idea that the country can have a relative advantage in producing a product. Another phrase for that is a margin of superiority. What that basically means is they can sell the product could be a good, it could be a service, they can sell it at a lower marginal cost than, than perhaps a, a producer in, other, in a, another country. The basic rule is specialise in the goods and services that you are relatively best at and that should in theory create some gains from trade. Now this, this model of comparative advantage often focuses on the endowment of factors of production that a country might possess. Typically, for example, if a nation is uh, endowed and blessed with abundant cheap labour, perhaps skilled labour as well, they will tend to specialise in and then export the products which they can produce most cheaply using that labour. Um, typically, a country's export embody the abundant factor. It could be labour, it could be land, natural resources, it could be high, highly capital intensive products whereas a country's imports embody the scarce factor. Uh, India, for example, is a net importer of oil, whereas Norway is a net exporter of oil. The theory of trade assumes that factors of production are fairly mobile from sector to sector. And that's something we can challenge as we go through the answer here. Here's a simple uh, numerical example of how the law of comparative advantage works. Let's take two countries. Germany and Italy, we assume they're going to produce just two products, uh, freezers and dishwashers, two consumer durables. In our first slide here, half of each country's available resources have been allocated to both and the table shows the outputs of freezers and dishwashers. Hopefully you can see that Germany, with half of resources allocated to each, can produce more freezers in Italy and more dishwashers. Uh, a thousand, Italy is 800 when it comes to freezers, 500 compared to 200 when it comes to dishwashers. 
So we would say that Germany has an absolute advantage in both goods, but actually Italy is closer to Germany in relative terms. If you think about the proportions here, it's much closer in terms of freezers. It's eight tenths as good at freezers, but only two fifths as good at dishwashers. So Italy has the comparative advantage in freezers. Germany has the comparative advantage in dishwashers. We add up the total output before any specialization takes place of 1,800 freezers and 700 dishwashers from the two countries combined. Well, the law of specialization says that Germany should specialize in dishwashers and Italy should specialize in freezers. So, for example, Germany, assuming constant returns to scale, could give up uh, half of its uh, output of freezers, uh, so it could give up 600 units of freezers. And uh, because the internal opportunity cost ratio is uh, two to one, they could gain 300 dishwashers in exchange just by specializing there. Italy, likewise, well, they have the absolute disadvantage, so perhaps they'll specialize just in freezers, and with constant returns to scale, they can double up from 800 to 1600, but it means they don't have any dishwashers uh, that they had before. So they lose 200. If we add up the totals, we find that now, after specialization, uh, the output is higher. There are 2,000 freezers, a gain of 200, and there are 800 dishwashers, a gain of 100. So we've shown in this example how specialization can lead to an increase in the output of both products, even though actually the total resources available haven't changed. This is just the reallocation effect. Now, what, uh, we're almost there in terms of this example. What really matters is whether countries, having specialized, can then gain from trade. And the really important concept that has to come into your analysis is the idea of the terms of trade. How many freezers have to be sacrificed by, by a dishwasher uh, and vice versa? If we just think about the internal opportunity costs without trade, Germany gets two extra freezers for every dishwasher it gives up. Uh, Italy has to give up four freezers for every extra dishwasher it produces. So two to one, four to one, is there a mutually beneficial terms of trade that will benefit both countries? And the answer is yes, because there's a gap between two and four, and the answer is three. If these two countries traded three freezers for one dishwasher, we can show how they'll end up with more of both. Let's see how this works. This is our final output uh, table. Germany, if you remember, uh, was producing um, a lot of dishwashers. Okay, they went up. Now, if, they, if, they, if they're prepared to export 250 dishwashers to Italy, so Italy will then come, come up to 250. So Germany exports 250 dishwashers to Italy. Italy, in exchange, is prepared to give up 750 of its freezers. So Germany will pick up 750 compared with where it was before. Our figures stay the same at 2,000 and 800. That's above where they were before, again, of 200 freezers and 100 dishwashers. But hopefully you can see, and you can always rewind the presentation to show this, that in each area here, Germany has more freezers than it had before and more dishwashers. Italy, 850, that's more freezers than they had at the start and more dishwashers. In other words, we've shown that from specialization and then trading at three for one, we can end up with more of both products than we had right at the start. This is the classic example of what's called the theory of the gains from trade. And this trade theory is built on certain assumptions. At an A2 level, it's quite important you understand what these assumptions are. The first assumption, underlying that little bit of maths from the last, uh, last few minutes, is the assumption of constant returns to scale. If Italy reallocates half of its resources uh, from one product to the other, they can double their output. That's a, a fairly neutral assumption. Clearly there's a potential for, for diseconomies of scale, but actually if you specialize, one would hope that you might enjoy economies of scale, in which case the gains from trade could be even higher than before. But we're gonna assume constant returns to scale for the moment. Second key assumption is that the factors of production are mobile. 
In other words, the workers who were producing freezers are equally productive when they're transferred into producing dishwashers. Now clearly that is a simplifying assumption and it may not hold true in the real world. It's one that we make in this theory. The third assumption is that we have, we're ignoring externalities. It could be the case, for example, that uh, specialization leads to more pollution and congestion and, and environmental damage, such as carbon emissions. These are clearly external and social costs of production. Uh, they're important in the wider debate. Uh, for example, the, the discussion about food miles in the world economy and the impact of trade on, on climate change. But in this theory, we assume that the externalities are not significant. We also assume that uh, when it comes to trading, that there is sufficient finance available, uh, for example, in the form of export credits, to make this trade actually happen. This assumption was challenged dramatically in 2007 2008 with the world financial crisis, where a lot of export businesses who had great products to sell suddenly found they couldn't get the, the export uh, trade credits or the, or the trade insurance they needed to, to, to complete the deals. And finally, uh, we're assuming that uh, trade actually can take place, that the barriers to trade are not sufficiently high uh, that this can happen. We live in a world where import tariffs are falling, uh, but there's a, a growing range of non-tariff barriers. Uh, when, when I do a special revision session on protectionism, we'll, we'll look at some examples of that. These are the basic assumptions behind the theory of comparative advantage. And it's important to be aware of these assumptions for the exam and also to be able to challenge them as part of the evaluation. Finally, in this session, we looked at comparative advantage, which is where countries trade uh, one product and import another. That's your basic economics of trade. So, for example, Norway exports oil and gas, and China exports manufactured products, uh, and Germany exports high-performance vehicles and consumer durables. That's the idea of international trade. Increasingly, and this is something that many students don't really cover, what we're seeing in the world economy is the rise of intra-industry trade. Let me just take you through what this means. Intra-industry trade is when a country exports and imports the same product. It takes a little bit of getting ahead around that you're taught a theory that one country is exporting one product because it's better at it and therefore allows it to, to import something different. Whereas actually what we tend to see in many countries is that nations are importing and exporting the same products, albeit differentiated differences in design and quality, for example. Intra-industry trade is an incredibly important feature of our fast-changing world economy. So countries such as Hong Kong and China, certainly Singapore, interestingly Mexico and countries like Malaysia, more and more they're engaging in intra-industry trade. Whereas there's a cluster of countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, which are heavily resource rich. They're focusing very much on primary uh, commodities and they have very little intra-industry trade and that actually is a, is a, is a long-term barrier to their development. Let's have a look at an example. These two charts are taken from the wonderful work of Cesar Hidalgo who maps what countries export and import. And this mosaic is for the UK, all kinds of different colors. And you can see here, for example, that one of Britain's biggest exports on the left-hand side there is cars. 8% of our exports of goods are motor vehicles. But look on the right-hand side. We also import cars as well. Um, look at the two tables on this slide. Down the left-hand side are our top nine imports of products. Cars, refined petroleum, crude oil, um, pharmaceutical products, gas turbines, diamonds, aircraft parts. Okay, cool, that's exports. What about, what about imports? Well, uh, oil, cars, uh, medical, uh, pharmaceutical products, computers, vehicle parts, uh, gold. A lot of the things that Britain imports are very similar to the products that Britain exports. And part of this is consumer preference. Uh, we want a different type of car or we want a slightly different make of computer. The demand uh, 
uh, is a factor driving this. Here's another example, country with uh, middle income status, Mexico. Uh, notice here, cars are very important to Mexico. It's one of the world's biggest car manufacturers now. And again, look at the left-hand table down at the bottom here. It's top six exports, crude oil, cars, computers, video displays, trucks, telephones. Now, how does that match on the right-hand side? Well, telephones are there. Uh, what else is there? Computers are there. Okay, cars are there. So three of the top six imports from Mexico are also in the top six exports. Countries such as Mexico are similar to the UK. They're importing and exporting of the same products. And this is because these countries have the capability and the capacity and the know-how to do it. It's actually a function of their stage of development. Now, here's some data on intra-industry trade. The higher the figure, the greater is what I've just talked about. So Hong Kong and Singapore are right up there with the United States, in fact, even a little higher in having the highest index of intra-industry trade, importing, exporting similar products. European Union, full of high-income developed uh, countries, is also pretty high, an index of above 60. But then contrast those four, Hong Kong, Singapore, USA, and Europe, contrast that starkly with two countries, Zambia, uh, with an index of 17 and the Central African Republic, CAR, which is an intra-industry trade ratio of two. That's the lowest in the world. And why is this? Well, let's look at Zambia. Our wonderful map from Cesar Hidalgo showing what Zambia exports. Just goods, services slightly different. This is just tangible goods. Look at that incredible image that over 70% of Zambian exports are copper, either in raw form or refined processed copper. Factor in tobacco and corn and cotton, and essentially Zambia is only really exporting by and large four products. It doesn't necessarily have the economic capacity and the know-how uh, to move beyond copper and tobacco and cotton, for example. In other words, its economy doesn't have the diversification uh, that uh, countries of higher incomes will have. And the CAR is right at the bottom of any index of intra-industry trade. It's incredibly heavily reliant on exporting wood and cotton. A little bit of scrap iron, some coffee, some waxes and some precious metals, but essentially uh, something like 85-87% of the CAR's exports are wood and cotton. It's an incredible challenge for these countries to try and break out of this very high level of primary export dependence. You think back to what I was saying just a few minutes ago, countries with that high level of primary dependence are exposed to changes in world demand and world prices. Uh, that the risks for them of trade are more significant, I think, for the country with a much more diversified export base. In other words, one which has a higher level of intra-industry trade. Just finally, uh, keep in mind this is a little link in to my next uh, revision webinar. You can find them all on the YouTube channel, which is about trade agreements and protectionism. We live in a world where there's more intra-industry trade we live in a world where there's a significant number, a growing number of trade agreements. Instead of a, a single unified world trade agreement, what we're finding is a plethora of bilateral agreements between one or two countries and regional trade agreements. This slide, which you can work your way through on the YouTube channel a little later on, just give you some really good examples of regional trade agreements. Bringing tariffs down eliminating quotas, trying to encourage the, the trade and the specialization that we've talked about in this revision session. Two at the bottom I think are incredibly important and worth doing a little bit of research on out of the exam. One is the Pacific Alliance, the regional trade agreement between countries such as Chile, Mexico and Peru. Very important. And the one at the bottom is potentially a game changer, the proposed free trade area 
encompassing countries such as the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, and Mexico. Uh, these are these are game changers if they happen, and they will certainly change the patterns of trade in the world economy over time. So this has been a revision webcast on just two main aspects of international trade. We've been through the theory of comparative advantage, and we've been through the idea of intra-industry trade. And I hope you found it useful. Uh, don't forget to log on to the tutor to you YouTube channel. All of our webinars, a lot of other resources are on there as well, and links to our website. And I hope you can get some good revision uh, content out of your exams from there. Thank you for joining us, and uh, look forward to meeting up again sometime soon.